Welcome to this service of worship. We are glad that you chose Anchorage Presbyterian Church. If you are visiting with us and would like to be added to our newsletter list or receive the Zoom login for our after worship fellowship time, please email the address below. Our guest preacher today is Roger Durham. He is a third generation elder of APC, following after his grandmother and his father. Roger earned a Doctor of Ministry degree from Union Seminary in Virginia and served as pastor of John Knox Presbyterian Church here in Louisville. He is now part of the sales organization for Snyder Electric. Roger is married to Ann Durham, owner of Thistle and Finch Farm, a flower farm on Old Henry Road. His oldest son, Ben, is executive director at Rosanna Hughes. He and his wife, Megan, just celebrated their son Henry's first birthday. Henry is Roger's first and only grandchild. Addison, Roger's middle child, is a director of food services at Rosanna Hughes. And his youngest son, his stepson, Max, has most recently been employed by Thistle and Finch Farm. We welcome Roger to our pulpit today. As Let us now worship the Lord, our God. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that all your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth receive him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Son of God, your blessings know no boundaries that faith cannot cross. Strengthen us to trust in your mercy. Reach out for your healing and receive your reconciliation. Amen.
So those biblical scholars among you will recognize the sermon title borrowed from another book of the Bible, actually, from Esther. Their words borrowed from Mordecai. You remember when Mordecai was speaking to Esther as she had an opportunity to intervene on behalf of the Jewish people. And he said, for such a time as this, I've modified it slightly, a time such as this. They are words that fit well in this Joseph narrative. And before I read the text, let me ask you this question. Have you ex ever experienced this? You find yourself in a situation that you could not have imagined, and you're faced with, a, with circumstances or choices for which you're not sure you're prepared. You realize too late that you have an opportunity to do something important, and you don't know whether to walk toward it or to run away from it, and you're not even sure that the choice is yours to make. Have you ever been there? Well, of course you have. All of us have. In one way or another, all of us have been at that Rubicon at some point or points in our lives. Some may have felt the moment to be bigger than it was. Some may have found it to be less. All of us, if we put our minds to it, can think of those times when we've been faced with a choice and we've wondered, how did I get here? And what do I do now? Well, those may have been the questions running through Joseph's mind as he stood before his brothers in Pharaoh's court in Egypt. They didn't recognize him, his brothers. He was standing right in front of them and they didn't recognize him. They saw Pharaoh's right-hand man. They saw the second most powerful person in all of Egypt, perhaps all, perhaps all the lands. They stood before him, a poor, starving band of brothers, hoping to buy enough grain to sustain them and their father, Jacob, for the duration of the famine. They were at his mercy. He held their survival in his hands, and they didn't know him. They didn't know that they were facing the brother whom they had sold into slavery all those years ago. And this is where we pick up the story. Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Hear the word of God. Then Joseph couldn't control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph, is my, father's, is my father still alive? But his brothers couldn't answer for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Make haste and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. And there I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. And now, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. 
You must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Make haste and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so it was that brother Joseph and his brothers were finally reunited and ultimately their father Jacob, Israel, would join them in the land of Egypt under the caring and watchful eye of Pharaoh to weather the ravages of the famine that would grip the land for another five years and God's story and the story of God's people marches on. But in that moment, before he revealed himself to his brothers, Joseph stood before them with the power to save or to condemn. And the thought must have swept through his mind like a shadow or a raging thundercloud. How did I get here? He knew the events well enough. He could hardly forget them. But how did it happen? Or more importantly, why did it happen? As for the how, Joseph would never forget the stinging jealousy that his brothers had developed for him and his multicolored coat, the one given to him, not to them, by their beloved father, Jacob. He was still haunted by the memory of his brothers selling him into slavery and walking away, turning their backs and walking back home to Jacob, never looking back. His body still bore the scars and the insult of being imprisoned in Pharaoh's court. Those memories would never leave him. He also remembered how the story turned, how his ability to interpret dreams endeared him to Pharaoh, and how his ability to manage Pharaoh's storage of grains and goods earned him promotions within the king's court. He remembered how he was instrumental in protecting Pharaoh from the coming famine. He knew how, in the factual sense, things had unfolded. He just didn't know why until he did. Something happened as he looked through prismed tears into his brother's faces that day. Something fell into place. It was as if the faith of his ancestors pulled the thread that tied the story together for Joseph that day. Come near to me, he said to them. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. He wasn't going to rewrite history. He wasn't going to gloss over the horrible thing they had done to him. Don't be afraid, don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Again, that's selling. For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me to preserve for you a remnant. It was not you who sent me here, but God. That was the why that Joseph discovered that day. For a time such as this, God sent me. It was not a statement of fact, it was a statement of faith. Joseph knew with the certainty of faith that the winding and torturous path that had led him to stand there before his brothers with the power to save them was not a result of their cruelty, was not a result of their hardness of heart or their jealousy. It was God's doing. It was a matter of God's intention. It was God's way of protecting his people in a time of great famine. Joseph knew that had he not been there, his family would likely not have survived for a time such as this. Have you ever been there? My first church at a seminary while I was too young to understand much, I remember a knock on my door one November Wednesday evening. It was the night before Thanksgiving. 
We just finished our uh, Thanksgiving Eve service at the church across the street. When I answered the door, there was a state trooper and one of the elders of the church standing there. The elder was the first to sp speak. He said, it's Tommy Pond. He's dead. He was hit by a drunk driver who crossed over the center lane and, and ran head on into him. Tommy had just turned 16. He was on his way home from work. We actually heard the sirens from the church during worship that night. I need to tell the parents of the state trooper, and I was wondering if you would uh, come along. Well, I looked at the elder and I said, if you're up to it, I, I think I should be the one to break this news and I'd like you to come along with me. No, no offense, officer. I just don't want them opening a door to see a state trooper bearing this news. I know them and they know me. I think I should do it. So we drove over to tell the parents, the elder and I, and my mind was racing wildly, searching for some way to tell them, some way to make sense of what had happened. And as I drove, my mind landed on certain memories. I remembered in a flash standing in an emergency room 10 years earlier as a teenager, as my youth group leaders were receiving the news that their two-year-old daughter had died, hit by a car driven by one of the youth group members. A different memory, I remembered a conversation with a seminary professor about how to bring meaning to people in crisis. And another memory, I remembered prayers I'd had with, I had led with the parents with whom I was about to speak, prayers after prayers in worship after worship, week after week, I remembered those things. I knocked on the door and we walked in and I thought, what am I doing here? I'm not old enough to be doing this. Then for some reason, Joseph came to mind, standing before his brothers, saying, God sent me. And I found a thread and I pulled together those memories and I found some words to say for a time such as this. Have you been there? There was a young woman, a girl still, really, a senior in high school. She hadn't had the best of growing up years. She was never part of the accepted circle. She always seemed to be left at the edges in middle school. She learned to cope through the help of two loving parents and a, and a very gentle and kind therapist. And once she got to high school, she started to get her feet underneath her. She found her people and she began to flourish, but there were some very dark days before that, dark enough for her to have considered taking her life more than once. Well, one Thursday evening, she got a text message from a friend, I need help, can you come over? It was a school night, unusual, but something about the tone of the text told her to go. So she did, and when she got there to her friend's house, her parents said she was up in her room, and when the girl went upstairs, knocked on the door, opened the bedroom door, she found her friend sitting on the bed with a bottle of pills in her hands, looking as if she wasn't sure what to do with them. Well, the girl wanted to run away, wanted to go call her parents, wanted to be anywhere but there, but for some reason she stayed. Her friend had texted her. So she walked in, closed the door behind her, sat down beside her friend in silence. She didn't have words. And she knew she didn't need words. She remembered what she had needed was presence in her dark moment. And that was enough. She must have wondered, what am I doing here? 
but she sat with her friend in silence until the moment passed and her friend handed her the bottle. Well, she had come to that moment, that Joseph moment, for a time such as this. With her own story to tell and her own memories to inform her. When we find ourselves there in those moments, and all of us do, they may not be as dramatic as those, but we find ourselves there. We rarely can see how the events of our lives prepared us for those moments, but they do. The lessons that we learn in our homes as children, the random events of our growing up years, some we chose, some we didn't, some just happened, they form a storehouse of memories that can inform us when we come to those defining moments. And by some miracle of grace, we may draw on those memories, those stories, in ways we couldn't have rehearsed. They empower us to act in ways we may not have anticipated. And if Joseph were there, he would lean in and whisper, you are prepared for this. Your story has prepared you for this. Well, I've thought of these, this Joseph story a lot over these last few months. It's been an unsettling story for me in many ways, hopeful and unsettling. Whether we know it or not, whether we mean to be or not, all of us stand somewhere near where Joseph stood when he was speaking to his brothers. Nearly 12 weeks ago, at approximately 825 Central Time, the lifeless body of George Floyd breathed its last. While many of us were celebrating the beginning of summer, it was Memorial Day after all, settling in after a backyard barbecue or coming home from the opening day at the local pool, George Floyd succumbed under the weight and pressure of a knee in his back on his neck applied by an arresting officer for eight minutes and 46 seconds. It was not the first time someone had died under such circumstances, and white men as well as black men have died under similar circumstances. But that day, in that moment, George Floyd's death became a crucible for our culture, screaming for definition. On that day, in that moment, our nation found itself at a defining point again. And like Joseph, many of us are wondering, how did we get here again? How does this keep happening? The events that ignited the flashpoint are clear. Those are not in dispute. And the centuries of pain and injustice that served as the accelerant, those are no mysteries to us. But why is this happening now? And, and what are we? What am I going to do in response? Like Joseph, we have a choice to make. We always have a choice to make. Do we turn our backs and walk away, acting as if there's things are beyond our control? Do we go about our own lives hoping that things will work out, that somehow things will change for the better, that someone will intervene. Joseph could have made that choice while facing his brothers. Or do we choose to engage? Do we look some way for some way to be a part of a solution? Do we open ourselves to the possibility that there is some thread that we can pull that will organize the events of our own lives in such a way that we feel uniquely prepared to do something? Well, that was the choice Claire Purnell made several weeks ago. 
She told us about it in a note to the congregation sent out at the end of June. In that article, she described for us in a very honest and confessional way her Joseph moment. If you read the article, you know that she decided that she had to do something in the wake of what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Doing nothing was not an option. So she went to a couple of peaceful protests in Louisville, and that's where it happened for her. Her life was changed in a way she did not anticipate. Where she had always been a quiet, thoughtful observer of life, caring and kind, who rarely ventured into the spotlight, she found herself compelled to think differently and to act differently, which led her to put her thoughts on, on, in, on, in writing and push them out there for all to see in a way that was new and I suspect a little or even more than a little frightening. And though she didn't say it, I wouldn't be surprised if she was wondering, how did I get here? And what do I do next? And Joseph would nod and smile and say, you know the answer to those questions. You have been prepared for a time such as this. What Joseph would tell all of us, if he were standing here today, is that, is that God prepares us for important moments in life. We may not see it, while it's happening, but God is teaching us, or offering at least to teach us through the events, the pieces of our lives, and those pieces are there to draw upon when the time is right. And when it arrives, it is up to us to find that thread that binds the pieces together in surprising ways so that we can do something important. It's our choice. Whether or not to find and pull the thread, the pieces are there, the thread is even there, we have a choice to make our Joseph moment. There have been a handful of defining moments for our nation in my lifetime. This is one of them. And that's why Joseph's story has been unsettling and hopeful for me over these weeks. It's unsettling because I feel an odd kinship with Joseph, standing there knowing that I can do something for good or I can walk away. And it's entirely my choice, and that's unsettling. But it's also hopeful, because if Joseph is to be believed, then we would not be here, I would not be here in this moment for a time such as this with the opportunity to do something good if God had not prepared me for it. As Claire said in the title of her article, in order for change to be made, we're going to have to do something together. And she's right. If we're going to avoid facing this moment again as a nation, we have to do something together. It's our choice. It's always our choice. May God give us the courage of Joseph to connect the dots, to find the thread within our own unique narratives, and to pull it in such a way that we feel compelled to do something, to make a difference in a time such as this. To God be glory forever and ever. Amen. With one mind in Christ and one heart in the Spirit, let us pray to the Lord of heaven and earth. In the name of Jesus, we pray for the Church. Make us faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, unashamed to stand with Him and share His cross, unafraid to offer our lives in love for the world. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray for the earth. 
let this wondrous world you have made continue to blaze with your glory. Do not let it be consumed by greed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray for all nations. Teach us not to act with vengeance and violence or to respond to evil with evil, but to live in peace and overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray for this community. Help us to extend hospitality to strangers, to contribute to the needs of the poor, and to live in harmony with our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray for loved ones. Let us rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, sharing the grace and love of Christ with all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Enable us, O God, by the power of your Spirit, to live our lives in a way that is worthy of the gospel, to the glory of the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We thank you for your generosity and support of our ministry and mission during this season of COVID-19. Remember that 15% of our pledges go to 16 deserving local, national, and international mission causes. Some of these include Eastern Area Community Ministries, Pathlight International, Cabbage Patch Settlement House, and Bellwood Home for Children. God has been generous in providing for our needs. Let us then give back a portion of what we've been so generously given. us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we come to these defining moments every so often in life, and when we do, we can take courage in Joseph's story, knowing that we don't come to moments without having been prepared. And so claim the faith and the courage of Joseph as you face those defining moments and be prepared to act as if you have been sent for a time such as this. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's kindness and graciousness be radiant within you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.